running a business is really tough, especially when you're a victim of crime. And that's just happened to me. We was robbed from one of our specialist piece of equipment that we use here on the farm, moving stuff around the 70 acre site that we've got here. It was an Advent, which is a machine that's got like forks on and you can cut grass with it, move equipment around. I put a little picture here. They broke in, broke all the locks and just stole it. And now it takes three months to get a new one. Insurance is going to go up. If we claim on it, I've got to make a decision whether we just lose the £70,000. Plus, I've got loads of customers that owe us loads of money at the moment. So that causes me big problems. Running out of space. And just a few days ago, I was feeling really good about everything. Sales were strong. Management accounts are really good. I'll show you what I got up to a few days ago. And you can see how my life just went at the top of the roller coaster right down to the bottom. But that's what being a business owner is all about. It's not all sunshine and rainbows. Check it out. We're at the Marsh Farm offices this morning. Actually, some of our big marketing team are based here that do all of our different brands. You can see some of our brands here on the walls. We've got Entrepreneurs University. Nigel's now looking after that. It is nice knit this morning. And we've got Marsh Farm, Rossi Ice Cream, Lee Valley, all that printing in-house. One of my big things that I like to do in business is measure stuff. And I love this little phrase, what doesn't get measured doesn't get managed. We track our sales for our businesses here. So this is Marsh Farm Father Christmas event. Uh, last year we did this and we're tracking each day compared to last year. Nice and visual over here, Lee Valley. We've actually doubled numbers compared to last year. We actually reduced the price. So that's really driven the sales there as well. Really interesting. Um, so yeah, things are looking good there. I want to go and now show you our dinosaur park. So we're finally outside on the Dinosaur Project update. The team have been working inside that building doing the family entertainment centre element. And we're finally breaking ground on the outside, all these big holes that we're putting in here and I don't even see them. A lot of work's got into that. That's how it can drain all of the water. You see there's holes everywhere. All this stuff that, unless you're in construction, I guess you don't know. And these wiggly woodway pathways are going to be the pathways. And then the dinosaurs will be in between. We've been working really hard to come up with innovative, unique ideas because there's loads of dinosaur parts around the country, but we want to do something a bit different. And that's why that family entertainment centre had to take preference. We're doing some really cool things in here, but it's going to look great. You can see here this metal structure over here. That's going to be an archaeological tent. And then they're going to go in there, then they're going to come out of there, go on the walkway, then enter into the family entertainment centre and then go into the theatre show. So there's going to be an element of dinosaurs walking around in costumes, big dinosaurs to see, plus loads of edutainment elements in that building. The big plan here is to increase the dwell time that our customers come here. So rather than just be here three or four hours, can we get that to five or six hours? Why is that important? Well, if you're running a visitor attraction, you want people to stay as long as possible so they feel like they've had really good value for money and also buy a secondary F&B purchase. That's food and beverage. So they might have had one or two coffees, but because they're staying here longer, they might need that third coffee or that second food spend. That's the big aim. And then we're tracking average customer value value on our food spend and if we're at four or five pounds can we get that to six pounds fifty by keeping people here longer because when they feel like they've had a great day they want to spend some more money and that's the big plan here What's really interesting about this project, this is in an area of the attraction where no one's ever been before. This used to just be a dumping ground for us. So behind that wooden facade, which is the edge of our Father Christmas experience, there's going to be the traditional Jurassic Park-esque, Jurassic Park-esque, not actual Jurassic Park gates, because we've not got the copyright for that, but we're going to sort of create our own version of it. Then they'll come into here, do the archaeological stuff, and then do all the stuff over there. As well as that key driver of getting dwell time up, which is a big part of outdoor leisure attractions, the other part is appealing to an older audience. I've been in this business of doing family entertainment now for 20 years. My son is seven in January, and he comes to Marsh Farm, and it's already a bit babyish for him where it would have been perfect for a six seven eight nine ten year old 20 years ago now because of this here youtube kids just want more stuff earlier so i'm hoping that this investment this is a huge investment for us into this dinosaur park will start attracting the seven eight nine and ten and eleven year olds to still want to come here rather than just the two three four and five and maybe even six year olds that are starting to get desensitized just to normal family fun and so we've got to be constantly aware of that it comes back to that phrase i always say if you don't innovate you evaporate. We're seeing these trends, we've got to be on them. 
Anyone that's been watching the channel for a while now will know that I obsess about bringing products and services in-house. You know, as soon as I'm spending over £100,000 with any one supplier, I might not definitely decide to do it in-house, but I definitely start putting thinking time to see if that's possible. Now, one of those was this printing in-house thing that I always talk about. These signs have been recycled two or three times because we do our printing in-house. What do you mean? Well, these are printed on a Corex Fomex board, and then we just overlay the print over the top. Each one of these, this would have been like a 200 quid spend on signage, but because we're doing it in-house, it becomes a 25, 30 pound spend on signage, and how good does it look? And I love that we're being green because when these are finished, we will just print over the top. And the branding looks great. All of the branding, all of the design, all of the print done, all in-house by our team. I always think, if you're not doing your marketing in-house, if you're not doing your, your marketing or your video in-house, you ain't doing it enough. If you're outsourcing that stuff, I just don't think you're doing it enough. What you might want to do is outsource to Watchdog what you're doing. You know, I do think about that. I've been thinking about that more recently, that we should get another marketing agency in or another pay-per-click specialist in to check what we're doing, to give a, you know, a judgy opinion to see if we can pick up any one, two percent ideas. And we've done that with YouTube. We've had some YouTube consultants talk to us every couple of years just to give us their opinion. Most of the time we think they're wrong and we can carry on our merry way, but we've picked up one or two things that have helped us improve. And that might be a better way forward. So if you're not doing your marketing in-house, you ain't doing enough and you ain't getting enough customers. Right, let's go to the Rossi ice cream parlor because we've got some fun happening there. You right, Dave? Got your digger all back, it's all good. Yeah, he's done it. Was that, just that little bugger broke off. What, and that cost two grand? Oh no, no, that was since then. Oh, That's it's broken again. And then you're just doing all the potholes. Yeah, everywhere. There's, there's so many. I've yeah. done some of the car park out there. And Thanks, mate. That. You're amazing. Thank you. Digger Dave, one of my favourites. It's just, I think, the constant effort. You see, he's doing all these potholes in the car park. This is our overflow car park. But it just, it just never stops. That's why we own all our own equipment so that we can do all this stuff, but the thing's always bloody break. And he really looks after it. Like, really looks after it. He's... We're now inside. We're now. We're now. <laughs> We're now in sunny South End on Sea, Westcliff in particular, which is home to the original ice cream parlour, the Rossi Ice Cream Parlour. It's 100 years old, and in December, November, the sales tank because look. This is a seafront. No one really wants to come here. How do we remedy that? Well, last year, if you watched any of our YouTube videos, we decorated it overnight in a big marketing video. I put a little link above my head. I reckon you should go and watch that because it's a really good way of thinking outside the box. If you've got a seasonal business with huge peaks and troughs, there are ways to overcome it. That video shows you. So we're trying to do the same thing again, but rather than doing it overnight, we're just going to do it during the day. And I got the same team that decorated it last year to do it again this year and the theme is we're going to do a gingerbread house i've just seen as i've pulled up that i don't think it's looking as good as last year so i'm now going to have that awkward conversation so you can see what they're doing from here they're decorating it i, I, I appreciate sometimes it's like building a house you make a big muddy hole don't you? you fill it with concrete and it doesn't look very much and at the end it all comes together i'm hoping that happens here i'm just not a fan of that white thing at the top I suppose it's meant to look like snow. Uh, all the printing that you see here, guess who printed that? Oh yeah, we did that in-house. How you doing? What's that, that white stuff? Is that meant to look like icing? Yeah. You're going right across with that? Do you think it'll be all right? What, out here? I don't like it. I will, I will tell you if I don't like it. Yeah. And in, in here, this is the first time we've closed the Rossi ice cream parlour because we're, we're putting in this new counter because the old one was completely rotten and destroyed. I put some pictures of them closing it down over my face right now. Oh my God, it was rotten, it was horrific, it was falling apart. And we're putting this in so that we can serve people better. It's just nicer. Um, it's exciting, isn't it? More tills so we can get speed of queue down. Big team doing it because we only want to be closed for one day. It's cost thousands to close this for one day. They were working through the night last night. Let's have a little look. Yeah, How's yeah. things going? Yeah, good. This is actually better than, a, better than what we had before, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. We was going to put marble in, and it was like eight grand, and I've 
Still think maybe we should have done that. How much was the marble? Eight five grand? grand? Oh, five grand. And this is 500 quid, but I think we should have done it. Right, Ian? Yeah, not bad. Indeed. Don't usually work with people, do you, mate? No. I'm as well as doing all our printing in-house, all of this is done in-house. All these guys work for us full-time, got our own full-time sparkies. Actually, Mr. Plumber uh, is outsourced, but most of the stuff we do is in-house. What's this costing us, Matt? Five grand all in. Yeah, we had a quote for someone to do accounts for us. It'd be tens of thousands. One of the big things, closing for a day, which I really hate doing because we have so many regulars and they break their habit. This place is like running a newspaper. If you imagine you just didn't produce your newspaper for one day, people would buy another newspaper and that is my, my concern. Matt's put this. Because this is, all these things, massive time savers, so that they can push the glass on to clean it up, can't they? All them little things. Usually when you make coffee, you have the wastage and you have to pull out a drawer, tap it in. But this is just going to go straight into a bin straight at the bottom. The top, yeah. So that'll go in, bang, bang, bang. So Because the drawer on a busy day gets filled up so quickly. Yeah. These giant, what are they meant to be? Sweets. Chocolates. These giant chocolates used to be ice cream tubs. The twinkle was decorated. It's making a little brick wall of them. Is that what you're doing? That's how green we are. What do you use? Is that mastic on there? Mastic, cork, silicon. Mastic, cork, silicon. Sounds like a song. Just hope it looks as good as last year, that's all I'm saying. It could be only started at 11 o'clock. Do you think it'd be finished by the end of the day? No. Is it easy to do it during the day yeah. compared to last year? One of the fastest growing parts of our business is our importing and exporting business. We make teddy bears, children's arts and crafts, and it's growing astronomically, especially over the last 24 months. And so I was on the race for space. Now, anyone that operates around the southeast of the United Kingdom will know that warehouse space is really hard in places like Essex, Hertfordshire, London, Kent, those home counties. Well, this was a warehouse that I managed to get and I've decided to buy it because it's in a banging location but it needs a huge amount of work. Um, 1.2 million quid and I reckon we'll easily spend about 700,000 pounds sorting it out. The location is key here, location, location, location. You know, we're near all the right road links but you compare it to our other warehouse um, which we're gonna go to in just a moment, you'll see that this is a lot older. I mean, look at the roof, it's just done. The roof is done. But thankfully, because we got so many orders, we had storage space. You can see all of our stuff. And nearly all of this stuff here that you're seeing right now is going out on Christmas orders over the next few weeks. So we've got party pieces here. We've got Teddy Tastic, all our children's teddy bears and arts and crafts. Um, I mean, it is filled to the rafters. And we're actually um, having three, four, four more 40-foot shipping containers coming in over the next few weeks. It's massive. Absolutely massive. The glass bottles. And these look great, don't they? Yeah. James Sinclair worked hard on these in China. <laughs> yeah, so what we did in here, these are called FSDUs. That stands for Freestanding Display Unit. Um, and to get these made in the UK would be hugely time consuming. Um, uh, and expensive and we used to make FSD using cardboard which is usually how they're made but what happens in cardboard you know they get wet on the floor with the cleaners and they start falling apart very quickly and then you just replace them replace them replace them so these are made of Fomex which is compressed foam I imagine because it's Oh, I'm just guessing there. Um, but these are party pieces. These are all going to our American customers. They're going to a big supermarket chain. And then these here are our teddy bear stands, which I, when I was in China, I worked on these. But look how beautifully they move. So we make teddy bears that children make at home, and these are going to all have uh, outfits on. And then the fluff that they make the teddy bears with, and also the sound modules. And then these ones here are the teddy bear storage. Again, I will. Oh, these are just fantastic. I'm really excited about this. So the, the teddy bears will be stored there. They collect their teddy bears, and then they choose the outfits and the accessories. And these are going to a load of holiday parks here in the UK. Um, I worked so hard on doing this. I can't wait to get these into shops. I'm hoping to get them into a big chain here in the UK. And this will have all of our key party pieces range as well. It's exciting, isn't it? It's exciting. This is our other big warehouse. Much newer, much nicer. We bought this about 18 months ago. 
Um, it's about 10 minutes down the road. You see the big difference. We actually paid 1.2 million for this half of the building. Um, and that one was 1.2 million, but this is much newer. But because it's 10 more minutes down the road, um, it's actually a lot cheaper, still a lot of money. And this is where we make all of our ice cream, our big bakery is here, and we do all of our distribution here as well. We've got a big team here. Come and have a look inside. So as soon as you come into this lovely building, you smell the delicious bakery treats that I'm making. You can't smell it through the YouTube video. I appreciate that. Uh, but we're making cakes here that we're distributing through party pieces. One of the things that we do when we buy companies is we always make sure one of our existing businesses can benefit or add value to that company. So part of pieces, we're now selling donuts, cakes, cookies across the nation, not just in our stores, which has really driven the revenue of part of pieces and given these guys even more work to do. We make amazing bakes and treats in here, selling it to our venues all around the nation. It's very exciting. I love walking in and just seeing the amazing things that we're making. You see the cakes there that they're finishing here as well. I'll take you in and show you some of the delicious treats we make. So let's try some of this sponge, it's delicious. Like that. Mm. So we wanted to make our donuts better, bigger, so that they're more healthy. But that machine that Jim's about to use now, which I call the wobbler, how does it work? Jim just wobbles them, doesn't it? Yeah, it cuts them and then sort of it's so clever. But this is not gonna be one donut, it's gonna be lots of donuts. 30. He's gonna put it in there, 30 donuts. We call this machine the wobbler. Wobble, wobble, wobble. And there they are, they come out the wobbler. That was about 30 seconds. Jim's made the dough, he's now turning it into a pizza. He puts it in the wobbler, they come out of there, then it goes into the fryer. What we wanted to do is make our donuts bigger, like these ones. Look at these new designs we've just done for Christmas. We're doing a gingerbread man donut, a Christmas tree donut, and a cute little reindeer donut, and we're gonna do quite high inclusion donuts as well. They all go to our shops because they're bigger because the cost of the dough isn't actually that much. The cost is all the decorating. So you might as well make them that 50% bigger because it just looks better value for money and our customers will appreciate it. It's exciting, isn't it? On goes the lot of Isn't it nice, eh? Just put it on my Instagram account, let my followers know that we make all this wonderful stuff. Thanks, gang, you're wonderful. Thanks, everyone. This big weird machine here just in case you're wondering is where we make all of our bread to so make all of our rolls and breads that go around sites and we make all that in bulk on other days because we're really only busy at weekends for all of that right let's get to the next part What's our big thank you to American Express for sponsoring this video? Now, I've teamed up with Amex to make great videos to help entrepreneurs and business owners grow their business. Now, specifically, I want to tell you about this video that I've just made. It's about the four classic mistakes that business owners make. I want you to go and check it out because I want you to avoid those classic mistakes. It's over on the American Express UK YouTube channel. Now, there's a link above my head where you can watch that video, also a link in the video description. It gets better than that because Amex have created the business trends and insights Hub. This is like a resource center for entrepreneurs and business owners where you can swipe and deploy loads of articles to implement good stuff into your business. I recommend that too. There's a link in the video description for that as well. Well gang, I'm here at the Blue Boar Hotel. It's a hotel we bought about six months ago. It's been going like gangbusters, doing really well. Very proud of the team here. Um, but I've also been using this room quite a lot as a studio really for making content. And I make sure that I prioritize making content. Loads of people on the YouTube in the comments, James, how do you make time for this? Actually, someone actually put a comment recently, I actually put it on the screen here. James, you must have to schedule in your sex life because you just seem so busy. I said, absolutely, not a joke. Someone actually did comment that. In fact, if you are the person that commented it, it's probably my favorite YouTube comment ever. Um, I'm not going to talk, I was going to make some dig there, but I thought my wife might watch one day, so I'm just going to leave that comment out of it, what I was actually going to say. But anyone that's married will probably know what I'm thinking. Um, so this is um, that's where I've been making some of our content. I've been doing lots of American Express content here in this beautiful room. I made a video today, three and a half hours of recording today, to make sure that you can grow your business. And this video is going to be seven tools and tactics that I use to scale and grow my business. It's going to come out in a couple of weeks, so keep an eye on that on the channel. I want to show you around 
the hotel now and just show you some of the improvements we've been getting up to. This little courtyard was one of the things that most attracted to me when I come and looked to buy this place. Just lovely, it's Chloe there. Is, is your dad still in there? Oh yeah, can we go in there as well? Chloe's gonna open it up for us. Chloe used to work at Marsh Farm, one of our other businesses, now managing the hotel. Love that we can promote within. But yeah, anyway, I just love this little courtyard. So this building is grade two listed. Um, parts of it's like 600 years old. I just, I like old stuff and the character of things. So, but we've got to improve this because a lot of it's falling apart. We've got some parts that we've, ex that we've improved that just look amazing now and other parts that don't look so amazing. So we're coming here. Oh, there was a big water leak on this ceiling. So we've just repaired all that today. That's going to be whitewashed. We've got this old carpet. Um, that needs to be renewed. We've got this massive giant kitchen. And one of the things that I always talk about is models. And running a restaurant is particularly hard. But we've got this massive asset. Now we do bed and breakfast here, but I don't really want to be doing frying and French cuisine and really complicated stuff. I know that you need a big expensive team to look after that and the cost of food prices. So we're just going to do afternoon teas on steroids, where you can have an afternoon tea, it's gonna be fiend and you can stay here. Removing the need uh, for expensive chefs and expensive ovens and expensive equipment. And we'll do that to the best of our ability. So we do bed and breakfast, which we do for all our hotel guests. And rather than do a model that just about makes money, which is very expensive to run a restaurant, we're gonna do afternoon teas and we can do it in the best possible way using our entertainment skill set that we've learned over the last 20 years to do it better than everyone else. Now, who wouldn't like a bottomless afternoon tea where you can actually stay the night in the hotel as well? Like this is dull down here, not enough lights. Gary, good job, mate. I just... Uh, yeah, it looks better than what it was. I'll yeah. just enjoy that. Yeah. You're, getting, you're, you're a lot famous on my YouTube channel now. I'm more famous. And people actually put, who is the great Gary? <laughs> I like it. Here's the update on room 32. Um, new carpets are in and a flicker of a light bulb. Oh my God, it's, it's terrible light in here. So we're gonna get a chandelier in here as well. Don't worry, these are not staying. They're just being put on for, oh look, there we go. Um, just to see if they all work because they were the old ones. It's, it's horrific, isn't it? I'll just leave that there. Um, so yeah, we're gonna have um, Cup & Co flooring in here all the things that we've learned from running hospitality and leisure businesses this is sort of the safety flooring that can take a battering it's really easy to clean nice power shower it's going to be good this game people are going to love it this is a giant kitchen you know most <laughs> hotels don't even have kitchens this big and all of this here is extraction you have to have this clean a couple of times a year if you're doing frying if you can remove all of that and become much more self-sufficient with less expensive equipment, then it's just profitable. And that's why you see in coffee shops, they don't do any frying, they're using like a Merry Chef conventional microwave oven. It's much quicker, you don't need skilled staff. And anyone that runs a hospitality and leisure business knows that getting people to run kitchens is becoming increasingly difficult and really hard to get those types of people and it's very stressful. So I'm trying to remove all of that, bring the insurance down, speed and service up. And look, we're in a high street. There's loads of restaurants that are opening up all the time. I know the failure rate's high. I want them to take the risk rather than me. I just want to do the hotel bit very, very well. Do a brilliant breakfast and a brilliant afternoon too. You can tell this building, this sign is so old and it had a beautiful picture of the blue boar in it and then a windstorm knocked it down. Um, half down and then a lorry hit into it so we've yet to have this all repaired it's another thing that we can't really do in-house we had a specialist do it but it's looking amazing it's going to go pride and place in front of the building I'll show you where so she's going to be put back up there pride and place I just love look at this old 500 year old building in this beautiful Victorian postcard town so I just love this place it's just such a nice place to come if you come to any of my seminars my one day is you come here the night before. You come here the night before, we'll have a nice little drinky booze. I don't really drink, but I'll have a glass of orange juice and you can have a drink. And um, yeah, we do the next day a full seminar about growing your business. Really fun. So much work to do here, isn't there? Who do, oh, that, that's a bit of a repair job there, isn't there? So dark in here, isn't it? Very dark. 
Do you think we should sandblast all these, Gary? Do you think it'd be worth the time? Yeah, they'd come up. They would, they would come up nice. It's actually not... I've, I watched a video on YouTube of someone doing it. It's actually not that hard, is it? It's just time consuming. Do you mean that's original panelling? Be worth it, won't it, though, if it's two weeks of... It will game change this place, won't it? It's, it? It feels criminal that we've got those oak beams and they don't look no. like oak. Can't believe someone's so, so sad to do that. To... I'm here at the Shard today and I'm doing a presentation to 24 business owners in various industries and they're going to ask me questions about how I would grow their business. I've got a little presentation at the beginning with the biggest things I've learned in the last five years. There's going to be some little snips for you viewers. I'll do something a little bit different to what I've usually done because I thought, well, the people that come along to these type of events are usually more upscale business owners rather than me going to a seminar with a thousand people and there'll be a lot of startups in there. You guys are obviously well on the way. I thought, well, I'll do a little talk about the biggest things that I've learned in the last five years because the things that I've learned in the last five years are going through what I call the entrepreneur's pyramid, getting to the top level of entrepreneurship. I'll actually I'll just quickly explain that now with these pens that hardly anyone can see. Can you see this? If we look at most business owners, 80% operate in this size. 70% of businesses in the UK don't pay VAT. So that gives us a good indication that most businesses are micro businesses, one man bands. And then there's this 15% which most of us operate in. I call this the entrepreneur. I call this the solopreneur. And then this top level, the top 5%, the word I've coined called the investorpreneur. And we look up entrepreneur in the dictionary, it's seeker of opportunity. If you look up the word investor, it's the seeker of profit. And what I want is entrepreneurs to look for profitable opportunities. Because I sort of study myself really in the first instance is that we're attracted to opportunity because we're magnetised to it and the more successful we get, the more opportunities that are presented to us. And we only have a certain amount of time. So I want to make sure that we're choosing the right opportunities. And you look at investors of a very different approach to entrepreneurs. And they're the bits that we need to steal from them. We don't do very well usually as entrepreneurs. Investors just look for ROI. And they're happy to make 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10% returns or 12% returns, but it is all about return on investment. Now, when entrepreneurs get it right, they can make 100% returns, 200% returns, three, we can completely outdo investors, but they are much more analytical than us. What we do is we see there's a gap in the market, there's an opportunity, we could muscle in on that. And I actually <clears throat> think if we really study ourselves, a lot of the time, it's not about the profit. You look at someone like Elon Musk, that man I don't believe is driven by profit. It's driven by a sense to get stuff done. Um, Richard Branson, the same, you know, like why is a man at 74 years old, whatever he is now, interested in space tourism? He don't need any more money. He just doesn't need any more money. He's got two Caribbean islands. You know, why at 74 are we doing cruise ships? It's something that I've been studying, Richard, for a long time. You know, he was talking about that when he was 55, you know, because of a desire and a need to do that. So what I want us to try and get in that top 5% and what I've been forcing myself to do over the last five years is climb this entrepreneur's pyramid, not be a solopreneur, which is most people, not be the entrepreneur. An entrepreneur, if we could study this, this would be like a managing director for a business. The top 5% are shareholders of their business. And if we <clears throat> draw over the top in these pens that we can't see, you'll see um, I talk about these guys operating above the line, shareholders of their business. These guys here would be the MDs, so this is a shareholder, and these would be the technicians of a business. So most people are technicians of their business. If we were doing a company flow chart for anyone that employs people, you'd put all your directors up here. Just a normal Normal company flowchart, you see it's pyramid, it's a pyramid shape. And so I want you guys to be in the top 5%. And the stuff that I've learned, my behaviors, should I say, my habits over the last five years have been completely in the mindset of investorpreneur rather than entrepreneur. Because if you can do that, you become such a more powerful entrepreneur and you can do much bigger stuff. One of the biggest things that I've always thought about is why are Brits prepared to invest in buy-to-let property. I was one of those, I think it's a load of old 
when I started out, I was so obsessed with doing that. And you realize you put all your capital into something to have a positive 150, 200 pound a month of cash flow after the mortgages. Yet you'll all know members of your family that have gone out and bought buy to let properties. And they do it because it looks like an investment. So they're prepared to put capital out for very little return because it's regular and steady. And what you want to do is build your business to be in the same way, that you're building it to be an investment so that other people's money, venture capitalists, private equity, want to buy into your business. Um, and when you do that, you're just going to build a much better discipline and a much better business. Because what I don't want business owners to do is get to 65, 70 and sell a profitable job. Because if that's what you're building, you might as well go and get a profitable job. So if you're not building something to sell, you're hugely missing out. Over here is a little thing that I keep on reminding myself. I call this R&R, &R, refresh and remind myself. One of the reasons I make content and do my podcast and write the books. Yeah, I like selling books and making content and speaking and stuff. But the main primary reason for me doing this stuff is to constantly remind myself of the right stuff that I should be doing to grow my business. So refresh and remind yourself. Like, Go back over those stunning books that you've read that really drove you to make decisions like read Shoe Dog, read How to Get Rich by Felix Dennis every single year. Has anyone read How to Get Rich by Felix? That is like, like a number one book that you should be reading. The bloke's dead now, but he died. It was worth half a billion quid. I think it's one of the top books for entrepreneurs and business owners. Like, Just tap into that every year. Remind yourself of the stuff that works. You know, why is the diet industry so big? No one needs to pay Weight Watchers five quid a month and turn up to the village hall. They know, eat less cake and exercise you'll lose weight, but people are doing it every single week because they want to be refreshing and reminded about the stuff that they know they should be doing. Now, if you are seriously entrepreneurial, you are looking for those bright, shiny objects. So you need to put a system in place to make sure you're doing the stuff that you know that you should be doing. We <laughs> see this constantly in this space. Cryptocurrency comes up, entrepreneurs that are running very profitable businesses, like we're going all in on cryptocurrency and we don't really know what we're doing but there's that thing over there we like zoom over there or this buy refurbished refurbished property that people are talking about right then they're going into all this new stuff but actually the stuff that we know that works we should just double down on you know people are obsessed obsessed with doing the new rather than the successful in the entrepreneurship space they are obsessed with doing the new rather than the successful i'm just going to say it one more time because it's an absolute keynote thing that you need to remember we're obsessed with doing the new rather than the successful so R&R, &R, refresh and remind yourself of the stuff that works on a constant basis and try and create a system for good quality common sense advice. And as you know, what's the thing about common sense? Not very common. I'm a big fan of old school marketing and this is a little phrase I like to talk about this, be unusual in a very usual world. Hardly anyone is sending letters in the post. Hardly anyone is doing, picking up the phone nowadays. I oh, think what's doing this stuff. Got to use AI. It's all about AI. I'm listening to it now. It's like cryptocurrency all over again. It's like all anyone is talking about in entrepreneurship world. You know, like, come on. It's like what we're doing with content. You all know what's better? Writing a book, making a really good video, writing a really good article, or just getting AI to make content for you? Do you really think that is going to make mountains move now ai to assist yeah absolutely but the winners will always be the ones that do it right it's always the way we're just obsessed with the shortcuts they don't work they just don't work do they all them diet fads that people do sending a letter to someone a well thought out letter to the ceo of a business will open way more doors than a facebook ads campaign or a TikTok video if I really want to meet someone, I'll send them a big teddy bear in the post with a helium balloon. I've sent people an iPad before with a video of me if I thought it was going to get me involved. I still believe human to human, when it really matters, is the way to get it over the line. I'll always pick up the phone or FaceTime video over just sending an email. I'll try and be as good as possible. Leverage. I want to talk about this. 
Leverage is the superpower of entrepreneurs and business owners. And when we think of leverage, usually we sort of hopscotch into property. We've got a million pound property we own. We've only got a hundred thousand mortgage on it. Let's leverage the 900 grand. That's how most people think about leverage. But actually, that's tiny. The best, best leverage is, can we leverage our database? Have we got a brand that we can leverage? Have we got a set of systems and processes that we can leverage? Have we got a management team that we can leverage? The reason I can do so many things and buy so many businesses is because of those key lieutenants, that management team, I'm looking to leverage them. That's the most powerful thing. Your management team, you've got a really cool set of managers, you become invincible in the world of entrepreneurship. Invincible. It takes time to build. You might only get one or two A players every couple of years. But once you've got them, harness them, keep them, train them, improve them, make them better. You're their coach. And the better way to think about is you work for your staff. Your staff don't work for you. You are your staff's teacher. How do you make your staff as good as possible? And don't be like most of the school analogy, the teacher spends all their time on the naughty kids. You don't have to do that in a business. You know, if you've got bad staff, hire, sort of hire slow, fire fast. If you can't change the people, change the people and get better at doing it. Sometimes you've got people in the wrong role as well. And if you get big enough, you can move them into a different role and they blossom. If you get that gut instinct that this person isn't right for you, then you need to make that decision. Don't let it take nine months. Once you get that feeling, we put it off for too long. I'm guilty of that because we're also human beings. But it's better for them and it's better for you. And one of the things that I haven't put this on, but I'll, I'll speak about this now. It's all about models in business. Some models are profitable and some are not. And you can put all the passion, all the energy, all the enthusiasm. But if the model isn't good, it ain't good. So I opened an indoor play center. I put all my cash into it. I look at it and I go, oh, this isn't a good model. It's low barrier to entry. The weather depends on what we're going to generate. Add a day nursery to it. It now becomes a very profitable model. And that building can make a quarter of a million pounds of EBITDA. Take the day nursery away and you make 50,000 of EBITDA. And that's too slim. If you have a bad year, the 50,000 is wiped out. But also, if you've got standalone day nurseries, 70% of them don't make money. So it's all about having the right size of day nursery. If you get a day nursery of only 28 spaces, it doesn't make money. You go to 70 spaces, that's the sweet spot. You've got ones that are 150 size big, um, 150 spaces, they can't actually fill them and they've actually got an excess overhead that they can't fill. So what I'm trying to say is you need to find the model and tweak the model to get profitability. I've also discovered this over the last five years, just looking at the things that I've been doing, that 10 years is when the fun begins. So if you start a business, you might start making paper profits in three or four years, but extracting cash out of the business into your PBA, your personal bank account, really you're on a 10 year journey. And it's happened, like I look at Teddy Tastit. So I started this teddy bear business. It's now coming into year eight. Year eight's been the best year. We get an establishment. People are just recommending us. We're pulling the best opportunities towards us that just wasn't there in years one, two, and three. And actually, in years one, two, and three, it got most of my time pushing all of my energy into it. Now I put very little energy into it. An establishment and that, that magic 10-year goal is coming. Good stuff starts to happen in the business. So it's 10 years for me for when things really start getting good. And most people overestimate what can be done in a year and massively underestimate what can be done in 10 years. Anyone that's had children realises that actually 10 years isn't a long time, but when you're in it and trading, it is a long time. It is a long time. And so that 10-year thing, try and think in 10-year chunks, what does my business look like at year 10?